when John the Baptist came after the 400 years of silence between the two testaments, he came preaching, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. When Jesus began to preach, he preached the same message. He said, repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now the disciples have been with Jesus for nearly three years, and they still do not in their minds know when the kingdom of God is coming. And it is of some interest if we go ahead after the death of Christ, the period during which they felt that the whole project had fallen through, and then when Jesus had met with them in Galilee and they were reassured that he was alive, and after his ascension, but just before the ascension, they had asked him again, wilt thou at this time, Acts 1, restore the kingdom to Israel? And Jesus said to them, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father has kept in his own power, but you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is given unto you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. In other words, friends, Jesus is more interested himself in the church being interested, in being filled with the Spirit of God, no period now, to the end that the gospel is preached to all the world than any other subject. Jesus is more interested in the gospel being taken to the world than he is in fulfillment of prophecy. He's more interested in the gospel being taken to the rest of the world than he is even in us being filled with the Spirit unless it's to that end. I am a believer in the infilling of the Holy Spirit. I'm Pentecostal. But that is not an end in itself. That is not an objective. That's not a purpose. It's not a goal. It's a tool. And the purpose of the coming of the Spirit is taught by Jesus very clearly. That is to make possible the effective witnessing of a vital church throughout the world. When the Holy Spirit has come, ye shall be witnesses unto me to the end of the age. Now he does give us some warnings here. He said, first of all, the kingdom of God is not going to come with signs which can be observed. Now, we should get this firmly in our minds because, well, I do it too. Well, there are certain evidences such as the reestablishment of the Israelis in Palestine. There are other signs, the production of satellites for communication and uh, things being seen around the world simultaneously. All of these. Uh, are fulfillments of prophecy, and they give us indications that the end time of this age, not of the world, may not be far away. But Jesus warns us here that our main interest is not to be in those signs. He said, uh, the kingdom of God basically, basically, is not coming with signs. The kingdom of God, while it is going to manifest itself externally later, for the time being, now, and ever since Jesus' time till now, the basic manifestation of the kingdom of God is something that happens inside of people and makes them different and modifies them. Prophecy is largely external. It'll happen out there someplace. Happened in the Battle of Armageddon. Happened on that great plain as if it's Draylin, up there between Mount Carmel and the Sea of Galilee. Uh, this is where the, the external things will happen. But long before that battle is fought, there's an internal battle that's being fought. Dr. Charles S. Price, for many years, long deceased now, but for many years, probably the best known Pentecostal speaker, he never belonged to an official uh, de Pentecostal denomination for personal reasons. But uh, he was a tremendous speaker, and he used to, uh, as an orator, say, the great battles of the world were not fought like those of Napoleon at Austerlitz and Waterloo. But the greatest battles in the world have been fought inside the human breast. And that's what we're talking about here. The kingdom of God is within you, or as this translation says, in the midst of you. But it's, it's in us, today, in us. Um, he goes on about this subject of prophecy, though, because it interests them. And we're going to have Bud read for us from verse 22 through verse 24. And he said to the disciples, The days are coming when you will desire to see one of the days of the Son of Man, and you will not see it. And they will say to you, Lo there, or lo here, do not 
go, do not follow them. For as lightning flashes and lights up the sky from one side to the other, so will the Son of Man be in his day. The time is going to come that they wish that Jesus were back here on the earth, that they could see him and be with him. And he said, you will not see it. Now, whether he means no disciples will see it, at least these disciples living then will not see it. The return of Jesus would be long after their day, as we have discovered. And he said, when this time comes, when people are wanting the return of the Messiah, that out of this desire will come prophets. He didn't say here false prophets, but they are. Prophets who will seize upon this desire of the people and will say it's happened. It's happened. We, we've had people down through the years who've claimed to be Jesus come back in the flesh. We have folks under the, uh, in the Eastern religions who claim reincarnation, that this person is a Christ or a Buddha or whatever, come back in the flesh. And they will say, lo, he's here. And uh, it's not wise for me to name names here, but if you follow the current cults, you will know that there are people who call themselves God or the prophet of God. Come back in this particular day. And they'll have this man off someplace. He's come here, he's come there. Jesus said, pay no attention to it. Pay no attention to it. And then he said, when the Son of Man really comes, it is going to be as sudden as lightning from the east to the west, one side to the other. So will the Son of Man come like lightning. I'm not very much for speculation, but let's do a little speculating here. Uh, there is something in our day that gives a hint here that we've never had before. And that is the possibility that this coming as lightning is not going to be a miracle at all, as far as the seeing is concerned. Because if Jesus comes back to Jerusalem today, he can be seen around the world by satellite communication. It is not really this passage that uh, gave me problems in the past because I've always granted to God the power to work any miracle he needs. And while I did not understand any possible mechanics, I was not burdened by the fact that I could not explain how Jesus could be seen around the entire 25,000 miles of the Earth's equator uh, all at one time. But in Revelation, we have an equally visible situation which is hard to explain otherwise, and that is that there are going to be two witnesses. They're going to be hated by people because they witness for the Lord and they have power proceeding out of their mouths to bring judgment upon their hearers. And when they are slain and they are allowed to lie unburied in the streets of Jerusalem for three and a half days, and the whole world is going to rejoice over them, that's going to see them. How could the world see them? And then they'd be resurrected, and in fear, they would again, they'd be seen around the world. This I could not understand. It's no problem. I have never been in Palestine, but I have seen Palestine by virtue of satellite. It's lightning, it's electricity. It's around the world. Simultaneous, as fast as speed of light. And friends, this is the first generation that could, that has the hardware for this to occur without a miraculous intervention on the part of God. Of course, we know that the return of Jesus himself would be a miracle, but the seeing of him does not necessarily at this time any longer require a miracle. Now, Jesus continues with this subject, and we're going to read now verses 25 through verse 30, please. But first, he must suffer many things and be rejected by this generation. As it was in the days of Noah, so will it be in the days of the Son of Man. 